how do you like organize some of this? You know, it's based on what I want to get better at. Do you sometimes uh, want to stay connected to certain movements like like a squat, maybe like a bench? Oh, for sure. I, I enjoy it. That's why I do it and I sprinkle in from time to time. Just see, all right, have I really progressed or have I lost anything with training the way I've been training? And usually... I haven't. Is the bell really the thing that you think is like the most beneficial? There's so much you can do with it. It's endless. And if you are having days where you just don't want to work with different machinery, you can get a bell and just do so much. Some people would assume that working with kettlebells, there's no way you can build big arms. So people see it as like, it's not necessary. I can load up a barbell. It's, yeah, but it's a little bit different because you now you're loading up your spine, you're tense. And mm -hmm. it's not the same. Like holding the kettlebell, you have to get stronger, your grip, like all this stuff. And it's so much better. So kettlebells don't work, and you're now doing cables. You switched over to all cables all the time. All cables. Now, what's going on? You change up your training a little bit? You've been exposing yourself to some different things? Yeah, I started mixing in more like, more a little more machine and like cable stuff. Because I miss, I think I was missing some of like the the cable flies and stuff that mm -hmm. I used to do for chess and like some of the shoulder work. Oh, you're trying to get a pump. <laughs> That's what this is about. So so what I've been doing, I use it as like my warm up. Like I'll start with like some flies and stuff and then I'll yeah. get into my kettlebell work, whether I'm doing like upper body or whatever. And I just feel like everything's more activated and ready to go after I do like five or six sets of mm. just cable work. Yeah, we were talking a little bit about uh, running and uh, you used to be a running back. And so I think... For someone like yourself that maybe is uh, detached from that form of athleticism, when you go back to running, you probably have to be cautious, right? There's some things you probably got need to pay attention to. But the way that you ran when you were 18 might not be the same exact way that you can run right now unless you condition yourself specifically to sprint, right? That For kind sure. Of thing. Yeah, you can't just go back into it as if you just can go out there and sprint. You got to be really cautious and understand like, yeah, you may be able to do it, but like your body's not going to react the same way it did when you were doing it all the time. You were doing track too, right? Yep. I did a lot of track. It was just 100, 200, 4 by one four by 2 just mostly like sprinting. But now like my training has completely changed. I do a lot of distance, slow running. So I'm never really putting in like that power sprint run. So I like got to like hold off on that a little bit. Yeah. Are you trying to get back to that? Is that something, a capacity that you're trying to get back soon or? Um, I, I feel like I'll, I could still do it. I just, I don't know if my body will recover the same way it would if I'm just doing long distance. But I do want to have at least one day where I'm like doing some sprinting work. And when you say long distance, what do you, like, what's long distance for you? Uh, That eight to like 10 range miles. <laughs> You doing that? Yeah. <laughs> Bro, that's actually... You, both of you guys, that's super fucking impressive because you're big as fuck. Yeah. <laughs> I was just telling I him... I wait to lug around. Yeah, that's yeah. What I was just telling him how is for a while I was trying to do it at like that seven, eight minute mile pace. Mm -hmm. And at the weight I am, the impact and the stress your body takes, it's, it's a lot. Like, so to recover from that while you're still training heavy weights and a lot of stuff, your body just, it never recovers. So I had to bring my pace down to like that really like slow 10 minute, 12 minute mile pace. Mm -hmm. And I'm still getting work done. I'm still getting the exercise I need. And I'm learning how to keep the distance. Doing that in vivos too? Yep. Or? Barefoot, okay. yep. Yeah. And that's when you uh, are doing some of these things um, with particular types of shoes, if you're wearing shoes that have a huge cushion, wearing like a Hoka or something like that, or Nike, um, some of these shoes that have carbon fiber foot plate, it has a... Uh, some advantages, but it also has some disadvantages. So yeah, people biggest. need to be kind of cautious and know about those. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it's because at the end of the day, I, the idea is to be connected to the ground. No matter how, whatever it is, the feedback you need when you're running, you need to have that. So wearing shoes or being barefoot kind of helps you adjust how you're running, like your form. But when you have these shoes that have like this big cushion, you're not getting the feedback you need. You're kind of just like floating on like, clouds or like mm -hmm. the cushion and after a while like i deal with a lot of like shin and calf problems when i'm using those shoes and it's just mm -hmm. awful the way those shoes are designed you know if you grab them and, and you, from the middle and you try to squish them together then they spring back apart and it makes you kind of think in your head well if i don't bend the shoe much when i'm running then it's probably not going to give me as much mm -hmm. And so therefore, like running on your toes isn't really encouraged. You, you you actually, in those shoes, in my opinion, not that you want a heel strike, but you do kind of want to roll through. Mm -hmm. And it does have its it does have some advantages. You know, bigger a bigger guy or somebody that is just starting to run, you can go out and go on a casual run and maybe for the first time pick up three to five miles. 
But over time, it's uh, not allowing your brain and your body to know exactly the way that your foot's landing. Mm. And that's been my experience too. I don't, it's, it's been very few and far between that I wear those shoes anymore, unless someone's like, yo, let's go do like 12 miles or something like that. Yeah. And I think that's what, that's where it's actually beneficial. If you're going really, really far distance, like having that cushion kind of, it kind of saves you to be able to go further because when you're running barefoot, like when I first started running barefoot, I was only able to do like one or two miles because your legs, you're sore. It happens quickly. You have to kind of like build up like you do with straight training. You have to build up the ability to be able to go the distance in those shoes. What type of like, I'm, I'm curious about this. Like if you've seen visual changes in your feet, because I mentioned this multiple times, but like since using barefoot shoes and since doing a lot more things that way, my feet have visually like, they visually become wider. The tendons are thicker and I've noticed that through the years. So have you noticed any changes or have your feet always had that form? So I've you? always had wide feet, but as of recent, when I've been doing more barefoot stuff, I have noticed like my shoes, like they don't fit the same. Like my feet are getting wider a little bit. Yeah. Mm. And it's kind of awkward because I'm like, I'm always been like a 10 and a half, 11. And now like these shoes, like my feet actually filling these shoes out. But I just think, cause when you get that toe spread and you get that ability like to open up, your foot is no longer like this anymore. You're like this. So your feet is bigger at some point. <laughs> and one thing, like the thing I noticed too, is the way you use your feet are different. Cause like I've been jump roping a lot, right? But one thing I've noticed is like, I wish we could pull up, but I sometimes do this drill that we learned from our guy, uh, Brian McGinty, Power Plus, mm -hmm. um, on the on the uh, slant board where like you'll put your foot on it, right? And then you'll put your foot at different angles and balance. And to do that better, you kind of need to spread your toes out. Mm -hmm. But one thing I noticed too is that in, like when I jump rope too, when I'm jumping, when I'm bouncing off the ground, I'm not bouncing with my feet, my toes in. Like my toes are kind of spread out a little bit, even my pinky toe. And I'm kind of popping off yeah. the ground with my toes out, which I never would have done before. So it's cool the way, like not only do your feet change, but the way you actually even spread your toes when you do things changes. Oh, big time. Because you're allowed to, you're able to kind of use your feet as you would your hands at this point. Yeah. Like you never have your hands like this and be able, you can't pick anything up. Like your people feet. doing handstand walks. They're yeah. not doing it like this. They're, you know? Exactly. And that's why I do a lot of the toe stuff because it, it allows you to get that use your big toe more than actually your feet clawing. A lot of people, when they lift, a lot of do a lot of training to get power, they claw their feet. Mm. But you actually lose power because you're, a lot of the pressure goes towards the outer of your foot, not the inside where you want a lot of the pressure to go. Mm -hmm. You had a nagging like hamstring thing going on a while back. Yep. Did that subside? And It did because I started to focus more on like training barefoot and getting my abductor stronger and getting stronger in a narrow stance and making sure my feet and everything were like straight. So as I got stronger there, the hamstring thing kind of went away. Mm. When yeah. you say like, do you mean on like squats with your feet? Squats. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Cause I mean, most people have like a natural turnout. So your feet kind of gives to that point and you're always stronger on the outer side of your leg. Like your, your quad and then you get like tightness there mm -hmm. and you're usually weak in your abductors. Gotcha. Something I found really interesting that you said in the gym we were talking a little bit about jujitsu and you were just kind of saying like, it doesn't feel right for you at the moment to mm -hmm. do that much jujitsu because it pulls away from some other things that you love. And I think that's really important for people to examine for themselves. Um, whatever the sport sports are that you're trying to mix, whatever you're trying to do, I get asked often, like, how do you balance all these things uh, together? And it's actually very simple. It's like, what do I enjoy the most? Mm -hmm. And then it kind of, uh, I'll, I'll set things up from there. At the moment, I enjoy running the most. So I'm not going to lift to my detriment to the point where lifting messes me up too mm -hmm. much for running. And then it makes it easy to pr to plan and to program from there. For sure. And that's how I am with, with lifting. Like, I enjoy lifting. If I can't lift six or seven days a week, then there's something wrong. So, <laughs> <laughs> so when I was doing jujitsu, I was trying to go two to three times a week. And I also was balancing my running schedule two to three times a week. And I'm strength training six to seven times a week. I'd be like cramping in class because I just, my muscles are just fatigued. And it was just like, all right, something has to give. But I couldn't give up running. I couldn't give up lifting. And I was like, all right, take a step back with the jujitsu for a little bit. Mm -hmm. So so right now, what does it look like in terms of your schedule as far as running and uh, running and lifting? Like, how do you organize your weeks? So I run three times a week. It's usually Monday, Wednesday, and it's like a Saturday. Mm -hmm. My lifting is usually pretty much every day. And like, I'll have like, I will try to break the week sometimes. So like on a Wednesday when I'm going to do a longer run, 
I'll have like an off day from lifting and I'll still do like mo- mobility or movement prep and then I'll just do my run from there. And yeah, with the way that you lift, it's it's interesting because you're hitting so many different things at one time with a lot of the kettlebell stuff that you do. You're hitting mobility already. Um, so I, may, I would imagine maybe you don't have to spend as much time stretching and stuff like that or do you still? I don't. I mean, I try not to like, Maybe post workout, like I'll do a couple of stretches, but you don't have to spend as much time in your warm up because a lot of my stuff is always addressing the areas that I need to address as far as mobility, stability, like unilateral work. I do a ton of that, so I don't really have to spend too much time there. But the problem with it is, it's a lot of it is full body. So when you do a lot of full body training, then you are running as well. It's really hard to recover. <laughs> it's really hard to recover. Like full body over here, full body over there. Yes, it's it's tough. It's tough. Has the running gotten to a point because like when you do something for so long, like for you, you could probably get in a solid lifting session and it actually doesn't take too much out of you because mm-hmm. you're so proficient, right? Have you gotten to a point with running with that yet? Or is it like, are you still, is running just still continuing to feel easier and easier with the miles you're getting in? Uh, I feel easier and easier and I'm getting like the runner's high now. Like I get to the uh, point, like I'm actually seeking it out. Like when I'm running, I'm running so I can catch that win or that point for the run where you just feel like you just can go. Like your legs and your breathing are on the same page and you just go. Mm-hmm. Yeah. When you go out for a run, does it still every once in a while just feel awful? Um, if I'm not recovered from a training <laughs> session. But a lot of times for me, it's like I'm trying to, I'm seeking something. And that's what kind of why I got into running to kind of like, I feel like I was battling like a lot of demons and trying to figure out what's what. And like you go on a long run, nothing really survives those runs. Like you think through everything on monks quitting and monks turning back. You think through every issue you've been dealing with on a long run and you kind of figure it out. So mm. that's been helping me a lot. What are your demons, bro? <laughs> <laughs> what, what, what do you mean by demons though? I'm actually uh, more, more so like just stress work, different stuff, like stuff, like h- how to be better at different areas of life. And gotcha. Stuff's just sitting down, doing it. Like, lifting, it doesn't really help, like, because you're just lifting. You're in it for that moment. When you go on a run, it's like you go through all the thoughts of, like, fuck, It's like uh, introspective, yes. you know? It yeah. makes you kind of, like, look at yourself. And I don't know why it does that to you. Maybe it's just the exhaustion. I'm not sure. I don't know. I think it's when you're doing something that you're not particularly are great at. Like, mm-hmm. I'm not that great at running. Like, I enjoy doing it now, but I've always hated it. So, mm-hmm. like... Because I hate it and I'm forcing myself to do it, like there's moments when I'm running, I'm like, why the hell am I doing this? And that's when you start to think, like, what am I doing? Like, what's going on in my life? <laughs> and you kind of like search inside and you kind of figure it out and you overcome it while you're running. Yeah. Especially when you, what I do when I run, I try to pick a distance that's far from home. So the only way I get back is to, uh, I got to run back. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So it's like, all right, I'm in it now. Like, so I got to figure it out. But I think another thing to that is that <laughs> running is cyclical. You know what I mean? When you're lifting, you're going through different movements. You have different reps. You're going to be taking, it's it's like lift, break, lift, break, right? Running is step, 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 mm-hmm. step, step. And you're just going. You're going, yeah. So it's like at some point, like you've gotten to the runner's high phase, right? Where like, it's just you and your mind and yeah. your body's just moving. There's nothing else you can do but think or fucking, I don't know, zone out. Yeah. I mean- you, that's what I'm saying. That's why I, I think that's why I like it. Because a lot of times it's just like, I'm scratched. I'm dealing with shit. Let's go on a run. Yeah. You zone out big time to the point where like, I've listened to podcasts before and I'm like, that was a total waste. I, <laughs> I didn't hear hardly any, I can't recall anything that they said. Yeah. I need to go back and like, listen when I can pay attention better. Yeah. The, uh, some of the movements that I've seen you do, and you had me go through some of these movements last time, and hopefully we can uh, do more of that because I think you're here for a couple of days, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, how do you like organize some of this? Because uh, when you see what you're doing on social media, <laughs> a lot of times it's, uh, I'm always like, shit, how the hell does he like plan for each different movement? Uh, so it's pretty much based on what I want to get better at. So I go through phases where I'm like hyper focusing on one area and like really working on like rotation or like lateral work or like I said, I was working on my abductors for a while, trying to get them stronger and training in that motion. And it's actually, it's what's going to help me perform better when I'm running. So if there's something that I've been weak at or I feel like I have an issue with when I'm running, it's like, all right, I'm going to spend some time in my training and really apply it so I can perform better. And Or a certain lifts. Like if I want to be stronger in a unilateral lift or like a, a barbell squat or something, I'm going to work on things that will help me so I program in a way that will build those things. So I may spend a couple of weeks doing this, mm-hmm. 
may spend a couple of weeks doing something different. Do you sometimes uh, want to stay like stay connected to certain movements, like like a squat, maybe like a bench, or these exercises that maybe you liked, um, you know, years ago? Do you like to to kind of test your strength on those things here and there, just to kind of make sure you're within a certain range? Oh, for sure, I I enjoy it, but too much of it, I my ego started to kick in. It's like it's like I go to a commercial gym and I see people bench pressing. I'm like, All right, I want to bench press, and then I'm like. I don't just want to bench press. I want to bench press heavy. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, I want to bench heavy all the time. And like, I can't, and I can't get caught up in that because right. I already know how that's going to end. <laughs> <laughs> so that's why I do it. And I sprinkle in from time to time. Just see, all right, have I really progressed or have I lost anything with training the way I've been training? And usually I haven't. Like I was in there today and I was, I had the dumbbells. I was like, oh, it's heavier dumbbells than I've seen for a while. So mm-hmm. I was like, I'm going to see if I can do the 130s or the 140s. And I was able to lift it. So that's usually enough for me to be like, all right, I don't have to touch it for a while. Like, I still got it. and keep going. Let, <laughs> let me ask you this, man. Because, like, I think for myself, for example, right? One of the things that was a big mover for me in terms of, like, helping improve a lot of other abilities was strengthening my feet. Like, yeah. I noticed the difference it had in jujitsu. I noticed the difference it had in sprinting. I noticed the difference it had with a lot of things that I do. For you, you mentioned the adductors, right? Being so, Or is it, yeah, the adductors being something for your hamstring. What other weaknesses were you able to find that when you zoned in, it just had a cascade of effects on other things that you didn't even realize it would? Um, the ankles, um, oh. glutes. It's okay. like, it's areas when you, like, I feel like we use that term quad dominant a lot. A yeah. lot of people are quad dominant. It is usually because the, they don't train the hamstrings enough. Their glutes are, they just never fired when they need them to fire. So a lot of that is like, a lot of people are stronger without even knowing it. Sometimes when you make these tweaks to different things, training mm-hmm. mobility, getting muscles to fire and activate at the same time, you already produce more power. So it's just finding that. And when you do a lot of unilateral training with like split squats and stuff, you find where those stability muscles aren't like firing and kicking in at the same time. So when you see that, you're like, all right, I can adjust this. And when I go back to squat again, like my glutes are working now. Mm-hmm. My quads are working now. My abdominals are working now. So my squat is already powerful with me just making these small adjustments. I don't have to train it more. I just need to train it correctly. Do not neglect unilateral training. <laughs> no. Like unilateral training it's makes huge. so it 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 makes so much of a difference. Like yeah. well, from what you mentioned there, like well, as I as I worked because I noticed the ATG split squat was a weak movement for me, mm-hmm. um, especially since like my right knee was the knee I had surgery, and I noticed like fuck, I'm getting into that range of motion is really difficult. As I progress that movement, it's helped so many other things as far as like range of motion, et cetera. That it's just like doing and focusing on unilateral movements can make a big movement difference. Yeah. And I mean, that's the kind of approach that I was taking with a lot of my older clients. Cause a lot of them, you don't want to put them under a barbell. Like it's just, it's not appeasable. To, it's like, yes, I want them to be able to do it, but we don't have to. So it's like, how can we still build strength with them, but also address some of these limitations they have. So mm-hmm. those unilateral movements are great. Like you can build your legs doing split squats and lunges. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Having a counterbalance, something like a kettlebell, do you feel that that is really helping some people's mobility, like in your case or in the case of some of your clients, having that weight as a counterbalance? Do you think it helps them to progress with their mobility over time? Oh, yes, for sure. Because, I mean, if because it's such a stability thing, like you really got to hone in and lock in on what you're doing, especially if you're doing things like offset. Like you can't just go through mm-hmm. the movement. And sometimes when you're using the barbell or other movements, you can get away with a few ugly reps where your form just crashes or you lose stability. Your core is not as locked in. You could just get away with it when it's not really that great for you, but it's like you push through it. But when you're doing unilateral, you can't really cheat it because mm-hmm. you'll fall over, you'll lose your stance. You won't be able to be as locked in or get as deep into your rep. And you know which side you're weak on. Yeah. Like you can tell the difference between your good and your bad side, and then you can actually work to getting your bad side as good as your good right. side. Yeah. For the month of April, you're going to receive 25% off all Vivo barefoot shoes. And Seema, can you tell us why these shoes are so great? For years on this podcast, we've been talking about the benefit of barefoot shoes. And these are the shoes I used to use back in like 2017, 2018, my old Metcons. They are flat, but they're not very wide and they're very stiff and they don't move. That's why we've been partnering with and we've been using Vivo Barefoot Shoes. These are the modus strength shoe because 
not only are they wide, I have wide ass feet and so do we here on the podcast, especially as our feet have gotten stronger, but they're flexible. So when you're doing certain movements, like let's say you're doing jumping or you're doing split squats or you're doing movements where your toes need to flex and move, your feet are able to do that and perform in the shoe, allowing them to get stronger over time. And obviously they're flexible. So your foot's allowed to be a foot. And when you're doing all types of exercise, your feet will get stronger, improving your ability to move. Andrew, how can they get their hands on these? Yes, and for the month of April, you're going to receive 25% off all of your Vivo Barefoot shoes. That is a limited time deal for the month of April only. So if you've been waiting for the perfect time to buy your Vivo Barefoot shoes, now is that time. Head over to vivobarefoot.com slash powerproject, enter the code for April, and receive 25% off your entire order. Link is in the description as well as the podcast show notes. Yeah. And the kettlebell itself is kind of just an interesting piece. I mean, depending on where you place it, like the closer it is to your body, the further away. And you start to learn. You had me doing some of those movements where I was doing like a um, like a side lunge, basically. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. And it was difficult for me, but the kettlebell itself actually helps me because yep. um, I'm not super mobile. My body is fairly tight. And the weight, um, obviously, like, there's gravity, but there's also like an uh, – it's a counterbalance. Mm -hmm. You know, you shove that weight out more and then I'm able to like lean more, more to that more. side. And as to what Insema is saying is like, when you start doing these single leg movements, um, single leg stuff is actually really interesting because it's very, very rarely, I think, unless you're on a machine, very rarely is it single leg. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> right? yeah. Right? Like there's sure. always both legs. There's always both legs, yeah. Yeah, always both legs are working. But not only both legs, but both feet. Mm -hmm. And I didn't really recognize that in myself until I was doing some of the movements. When I would go to one side, I was like, wow, my when I go to my left, the reason why I have such a hard time going to my left is because my right foot's not doing anything. Yeah, yeah. Like my left side was doing a bunch, but my right side wasn't like, there was no movement. When I went to the right side, I could visibly see my toes working and moving and my foot trying to like create an arch and the other side of like half dead. Yeah. It's <laughs> like, like, what the hell's going on here? It's like every action has a reaction. It's like you working, like I always tell people like all muscles push and pull. So if you're pushing like on those side lunges you were pushing through on one side but you needed to pull back on the other side but you got to get your body to understand like this is happening and i need both sides to be working for a lot of people they just work that one side and they, the leg out there is doing nothing so it's much harder mm -hmm. you kind of just getting your body on the same page and understanding like this is your side of the movement and once i get to this point this side needs to kick in this is exactly what Jordan Shallow was talking about. He talked about it in a different way because he's got, you know, medical background, but he was talking about that push pull. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's just interesting, like how we communicate with one person and like <laughs> another podcast or two later, it pops up again. Yeah. Let me ask this, man, because like, you know, they, I think kettlebells are within that realm of people like to call functional fitness, mm -hmm. right? So, I mean, you've seen people working with maces, you've seen stuff, people doing stuff with ropes. Um, as far as modalities, what are stuff that you enjoy working with other than the bell? Or do you really, is the bell really the thing that you think is like the most beneficial? Uh, I think it's the most beneficial because it allows me personally to like really express myself in movement. Mm hmm and allows me to do everything and it doesn't really limit me. It keeps me able to explore more movement. I also like working with cables, but it gives me that same freedom of being able to move. Yeah. It's not like I don't like machines and different stuff, but it like it'll those are like I'm doing this for a reason. Like I'm able to kind of build and work in these fixed positions, mm -hmm. and kind of take advantage of them, but when you're working with kettlebell, it's so much you can do. You can load it differently, you can hold it over your head. You it's can just, flip that shit. Yeah, you can flip it. There's so much you can do with it. It's endless. And if you are having days where you just don't want to work with different machinery, you can get a bell and just do so much. Mm -hmm. Are you uh, at all worried about potentially losing functional strength when you're using like a barbell or using a machine or anything like that? No, because I'm still training. I was talking to him about this earlier. I'm still making sure I'm training full range. And it's not all that I'm doing. I feel like when I'm doing, if I'm doing machines and I kind of dedicate time to machine and cable work for like weeks on weeks and weeks and weeks, and then I'm not kind of like performing, I guess I can use it. I perform with kettlebells. So like you kind of build up, you practice with machinery and then I'm like, all right, I can, I'm like producing force. I'm mm -hmm. like acting out what I've been training to be able to do. So now when I use a machine, it's for a purpose. Yeah. I want to get stronger in this range of motion. I want to get stronger in this movement pattern. Now I'm going to perform when I use the bell. 
I, I kind of I love the way you, you put that because we we've mentioned something similar. There are people who will look at the bench press or the deadlift or these things and say these are non-functional movements. These make people unathletic. But the thing is, is that they do that to people within a vacuum. Mm -hmm. If you're only doing bench press, squat, deadlift, clean, those are the only things you do. That's your sport. You're going to move in a certain way. But if you're someone like yourself or you, Mark, where you do these movements and then you have things like running, jujitsu, you have the kettlebells, you have other things where now you exude the power that you've built with these movements, you're now moving the body and you're not becoming less functional. You only become less functional if you only do that shit. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. exactly. <laughs> and it's like, it's, I always seen it as like, it's like studying for a test and never taking a test. Mm. In a sense, like you always are drilling the deadlift, drilling the thing, but you mm. never do a power clean. You never... You never do that next progression because you're just stuck in that rigid movement of only doing that. Mm -hmm. When the whole point of being able to deadlift was seeing like how much force can I actually produce to be able to maybe do a hand clean or power mm -hmm. clean, the next step of that and be able to do it or just constantly deadlift and moving that range and we know where that ends up. Yeah. <laughs> what are we uh, not seeing from you? Like, um, you mentioned regressions. Do mm -hmm. you have regressions? Because I do. You do some amazing <laughs> shit, and I'm always like, hey, I kind of wonder, like, did he start somewhere yeah. else too, or is he just freaking amazing at these things? I do, and I think that's where a lot of the kickstand stuff come in. That mm -hmm. I like. It doesn't seem like a regression because I load him up like I'm doing a normal lift, but essentially, it's it's a regress movement. It's just allows me to be more balanced. I'm trying to get the single leg work. But I'm able to use the kickstand as, but when I put 200 pounds on my back, people are like, oh, that's exercise. Yeah. So, I mean, <laughs> you can train and load regress movements. I think for a while, people were like, what regress movements you're supposed to do them with less? Mm. That's not necessarily true. You can start with less. You do a but, partial range of motion. Yeah, or... yeah. But the whole point is to build it up. So if I have someone that can't do a full range of motion of squat, so when I do a squat with them and I'm doing only the top range of the squat, why not load it up if I'm trying to build up that top range? Mm -hmm. If the, they're weak in the bottom, I can do less weight there and we can kind of meet in the middle and get them to do a strong squat. There's so much cool stuff happening right here, dog. Mm -hmm. Like you got the stability of your shoulder, you got the rotation of your rib cage. You're getting, like it's, I think like sometimes when people see some of the stuff you do, there are some people who are probably like, oh, that's not a good movement. It's a gimmick, yeah. but like, you don't realize the amount of things that you're working. You know, it's shit. That's all. I've never seen that before, by the way. Some of these That's movements, cool. though, I think they're like, they're like life. Like sometimes life, you get in a like sticky situation. You get yeah. in weird positions, you know, you get into, I mean, it'd be hard to think of like, you know, how you would apply or use that. But there's going to be times where you're trying to get up or you're trying to do something, especially if you're trying to be in a sport. Mm -hmm. And I can't even imagine jujitsu because you're trying to, you know, manage your own body along with somebody else's body. <laughs> and people are going to be pulling on you and twisting you, uh, much like some of these exercises are starting to look. For sure. I had the incident happen the other day where I, like, I missed a step. And I, like, went down to the point where I was almost in, like, a uh, toe squat. Uh -huh. Guess who practiced those all the time? <laughs> 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 so it wasn't the end of the world. Like, I yeah. was able to get out of it, no problem, because I trained that way. Yeah. What do you think? Because I, I know there are some... Uh... They're probably kettlebell purists, right? Mm -hmm. That see some of the stuff you do, or maybe they'll see you do like a, a snatch and they'll be like, that's not perfect snatch form. Yeah. How do you feel about some of that shit? Because I'm just like, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's, it's to a certain extent, it gets annoying, yeah. but I, get, I think I get less of it now because I've been open with me not caring. Like yeah. this is the way I do things and this is what works for me. Uh -huh. If you want to be that rigid in movement, you can do it that way. Like it's just... I'm gonna do this the way that works for me. And mm -hmm. I'm not I'm not getting hurt. I'm not getting less progress. I'm not getting less results. So it has to be working. Also, I think the one cool thing is that not everything must look perfect. No. Because when you start to challenge yourself mm -hmm. with like load and shit, like there's gonna be actually I think I think I saw Jared, Jared Cardona. He's been he's been working with heavy bells, like <laughs> yeah, heavy yeah, fucking yeah. bells. He's been I, doing some wild shit. Yeah, he's been doing a lot but of he heavy. mentioned something where he was like, you know, working with these heavy bells, there's gonna be energy leaks here and there, right? Like for sure. Fucking like that, and that's okay as long as you're being safe. Exactly. I mean, you give the wrong idea to people when you want them to pursue a perfect rep every time. So if they don't get a perfect rep, they're like, oh, I, I the set was just not it, or it doesn't look good. Like if you're working hard, it's never gonna be a perfect rep every single time. It's going to look different, especially if you are working on the top of your max. Mm -hmm. 
But if was, the thing is, is just as long as you're staying safe, because I think one cool thing about the stuff you're doing, the stuff that he's doing too, is that when you guys are working with this heavy load and there are some energy leaks, like you got to think life is like that too. Mm-hmm. Not every single movement in life, you're going to be perfect. And there's going to be a level of dy- a dynamic aspect to it where how are you going to recover this rep? What's the puzzle that your body is going to do to make sure that this is a successful rep without compromising you? Mm-hmm. And by challenging yourself with load, you're able to test that out. You're never irresponsible, obviously, yeah. but you're you're testing yourself. Yeah, and is having the ability to still get through it. Yep. Without it being dangerous. Because mm-hmm. you've seen people push through reps and you're like, ah, oh, you probably yeah. should have just dropped yeah. that. Yeah, yeah, it's true. <laughs> and you're gonna watch me do it. And I'm like, it still looks to to the naked eye, it'll still look like a clean rep. But to me, I'm like, I probably could have did that better, or it was just a little bit too heavy, or I was fatigued. Mm-hmm. Which stuff just naturally happens. So it's not the end of the world. Yeah. <laughs> What about, uh, how does it feel to breathe? Because I know that you said you had like a nose surgery, right? Yeah. So I had my septum. We had talked about it before where oh, I was I was pretty much 90% blocked my airways through my nose. So I was just mouth breathing. Shit. So in all my training, and I do a lot of high endurance stuff. I do a lot of strength. All my training, everything was just mouth breathing. Mm-hmm. So everything felt that much harder. I had to push that much harder to get through it, like to recover from it. But since the surgery, like, I just can go. <laughs> Sleep is better. Recovery is better. Mm. I feel like because I recover, I'm as able to put on more muscle mass. Like, Have you gotten bigger? I was actually going to ask you. you I look- put on more muscle. I put on more muscle. <laughs> 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 I yes. on muscle. Yes. all popping yes. out over I'm, here. <laughs> I put on more muscle. I'm able to do a lot more stuff and train, train longer, train harder, and get the results from it. Yeah. Mm. Anything in particular that you try to coach people through when they're utilizing, when they're doing some of your exercises uh, in terms of breathing? Uh, just, well, not even not in terms of breathing. It's just understanding, like, from, like, we talked about with the um, the feet thing, the connection. So it's the connection to the floor from your feet, but the connection to the floor from your core and your breathing. So it's like all these things need to be on the same page. And if you're stable from your foot, mm-hmm. you're stable in your center of gravity, and your breathing is on the same page, the movements kind of just flow. And you stay connected to the weight, too. You know, yep. There's no uh, energy leak with your arms in, comp- in comparison to the kettlebell or something like that. Yep, for sure. Yeah. Do you find, like, do you have any areas, because, you know, your hamstring used to be an issue for you, right? But is there anything that tends to pop up or have, for, for the most part, have you been able to deal with any of the problems that comes to your body? I feel like I'm able to deal with it and until I get to the point where I'm going to be stubborn and train. Like if I start to really put in more work, barbell pressing or dumbbell pressing, if I start to press it from that point, yeah. I'll start to have like the shoulder aches because I'm pushing it past the point where I need to push it. Mm-hmm. And I'm not training my back as much as well. I'm giving more attention. And I do that with legs a lot. Like I really train my quads a lot. Yeah. So my my hamstrings and my glutes, they, it's hard for them to keep up. Mm-hmm. So I have to put more attention to everything and not just kind of like hyper-focus on one area because I'm trying to get it to grow. Mm. Do you take like also like kind of a, how do you take like a bodybuilding approach to some stuff? Because for example, some people would assume that working with kettlebells, there's no way you can build big arms, right? Like, yeah. cause you have to work those biceps and triceps, right? So do you isolate those things with kettlebells too? Not necessarily, but when you think about holding, you holding around a hundred pound bells all the time, like your arms are. <laughs> and you're holding them here too. You're squatting and doing like stuff right exactly. here. Exactly. And that's why I had this argument the other day. A guy was like, a goblet squats are pointless because uh, you only can. I was like, yeah, well, if your upper body is not strong enough to hold 200 pounds, then yeah. But if you get your upper body strong enough to hold heavier weights, it still can get your legs going. Yeah. But I also, the way I use kettlebells, I use them because I have so much of a bodybuilding background with the training. My splits sometimes still look like, you look at my training, it's like, oh, he's still training like a bodybuilder. Mm-hmm. He's still rowing. He's still doing all these reps of squats and lunges. He's just holding kettlebells. Yeah. But people see it as like, it's not necessary. I can load up a barbell. It's, yeah, but it's a little bit different because you now you're loading up your spine, you're tense, and mm-hmm. it's not the same. Like holding the kettlebell, you have to get stronger, your grip, like all this stuff, and it's so much better. Yeah. It gives you a different tool. Yeah, for, for sure. And it's, it's, it mixes it up. For my clients, it's like, if you think about working with the everyday individual and you're putting them under a barbell squat all the time, mm-hmm. At some point, they're going to be like, I'm sick of this shit. <laughs> they're going to be tired of it. Like, I want to do something different because they're going to get the, they won't get the aches and pains you get because you know how to recover from it. But they're going to get the aches and pains of like 
what it comes with the back squatting all the time. You back squat with somebody every week, mm -hmm. all the time, and you're trying to push their weight and get them stronger. They don't deal with some aches and pains in the back, their hips, especially if they got limitations, what most people do have. Mm -hmm. They're going to deal with it. But if you're able to put them in these split squat positions and build strength unilaterally and just use the ball bell squat and use the bilateral movement as just stability and range of motion, it changes the dynamic of the movement. So like now when I ball bell squat, it feels good because I don't do it that much. Yeah. Yeah. When you coached me, um, it was amazing because you just made these like little adjustments Yeah. as we were going along. You, were, you would see the way I move and you're like, okay, well, Mark has trouble doing that. Let's kind of put you here. And then I was able to progress uh, throughout the workout. And I think sometimes when somebody's thinking about going in the gym and doing a squat or something like that, they might try it and they might only go down just a little bit and they might be like, oh my God, my knees are yeah, <laughs> just yeah. killing me. Or or even as a trainer, like as a trainer, it's such a great tool to have good understanding of the cable machines, the different machines in the gym, the free weights, the kettlebells, like the more tools that you have, the easier it's going to be to help somebody. For sure. And you and you able to bridge the gap of like the strength and the limitations of what people deal with because you get somebody that can't squat full range, you still need to build strength with these people. So if you need to shorten the range a little bit and load it up and help help them, like we practiced the one where I was you helping you use the band to get yeah. into a deeper, deeper range. And the band allow you to get, you was like, I haven't been this deep in a squat in forever. Mm -hmm. But working that constantly will get you back to that point of being able to get deep in that squat. When we were using bands, we weren't using any cables or anything. We just used the band. It's just being able to utilize your surroundings and different training things to get the result that you're looking for. Can you describe that? Like what, what you're talking about, using the bands to get deeper? Like I'm just, I'm trying to visualize yeah, I was, I was it. holding the band and you were holding. So he, he, he had like, a, what is it? Like the, the big band, like what was it? One of the thicker ones. Okay. And I was trying to get him to practice getting out of a squat. So okay. he was deep in it. It's kind of like being in a goblet and holding the kettlebell, mm -hmm. but now you're holding the band that has resistance. So now you have to pull to kind of get that resistance back. So not only he was working his legs, but he also, his arms were being worked, his core was being worked because he had to hold this position mm. and he was able to get it's deep almost, in the squat. Almost a little bit like the sissy squats that Andrew does mm. uh, with the cable. The cable's acting as the counterbalance. In this case, this makes sense. It, okay. it's the band acting as the counterbalance because we had the band attached to the yep. machine, yep. right? We had it... Uh, uh, knotted up on the machine and then I kind of pulled it. But what was cool about that is I got myself into position without a lot of band. And then I had, in order to sit in that position, I had to pull on the band. Pull on more. the band. And yeah. in order for me to get up from that spot, you had to pull the band. <laughs> I was like, oh shit, I need to pull the, yeah. a little bit of assistance out of the bottom. As you were mentioning, uh, some people, you know, some people are going to be weaker in certain positions. So for me, uh, it's not only just like a weakness there. I'm just like unfamiliar with that mm -hmm, position. It's mm -hmm. like new to me. Yeah, for sure. And that's what we, that's when we when I see people move, like you said, I was making minor adjustments as I saw you. I can pinpoint where the weakness is or where, and then I can just put you in that position and have you practice getting out of it or pressing out of it. Or like you see someone, they say, I have pain in my knee. I'm like, all right, so where does the pain happen? Amongst what point in the squat? So I was there. So all right, so let's stop you here now. And let you work this area because we know you can do that, no problem. And then have you get below it and practice going through it, no weight, or just using your assistance of a bar, using mm -hmm. the assistance of a wall, and just practice doing it that way. And you're able to kind of build that range. If you have a company, if you have a brand, if you have a product, if you have anything that requires attention, it is irresponsible of you to not have a podcast. I just released Full-Time Podcaster, the online podcasting course that's going to teach you everything you need to know about podcasting right now at PursuePodcasting.com. I've been able to podcast and learn with the absolute best in this industry. This course has everything I've learned in a very easy, convenient step-by-step -step guide so that way you can build a very successful podcast as well. You will also receive Monetize Like a Full time podcaster. This is an additional course that is focused just on monetizing your show, even if you don't have a big following. Normally, this is going to be $97, but you get that absolutely free if you purchase before April 12th at midnight. Head over to PursuePodcasting.com right now and pick up the Launch Week bundle. Link is in the description as well as the podcast show notes. What uh, what cable movements have you been like messing with that you found like been super beneficial for you or maybe even some clients? Uh, Chops, stuff like that. Stuff that I do with kettlebells, but you 
you don't get the resistant, the resistant piece yeah. of it. Yeah. It's kind of you just only work in the power piece of it. And that's what I wanted to get better at it. Because a lot of times when I use chops, I do like the 36 or something. I'm like, I want to start using the 40 or the 50 with it. But I need it to be able to practice it continuously. Like I got a tonal in my house now. Oh, yeah. okay. And those are great because they have like this eccentric piece where it pulls you back with just as much weight as you press forward with. It's amazing. I love it. <laughs> Dude, those at home, like the tonal, I know there's another company that I saw Bill Maeda using. He likes stapled it to his fence or something. Mm -hmm. But those companies with mm -hmm. those like those cables that you can literally just take anywhere, yeah. that's that's pretty fucking amazing. Yeah, it's pretty good. Is the tonal like pasted to the wall? It's yeah, it's like it's kind of like you mount a TV on the wall. Okay. And it has up to four hundred pounds of mm. like Resistance, yeah. Yeah, no, I think years ago, you know, maybe some of us would look at stuff like that and be like, nah, like, I'd just go to the gym, bro. Yeah, <laughs> for real. And I, mean, what I need that thing for. It's very, it's very helpful. But to kind of go back to what you're saying, uh, a lot of the stuff, a lot of, so like when I train certain movements, I like to be able to like prep my body for it. So a lot of the secondary muscles don't get as much work. So I've been kind of using the cables to kind of like, utilize that so i'll do like some funky tricep restrictions or something like that to get the triceps going before i'm doing like a heavy press with bells or something like that so i'll do like a burnout pretty much burning out like to me if i burn out the muscle is definitely going to be gone mm -hmm. mm -hmm. <laughs> and i tell people all the time it's like if the idea is muscle hypertrophy what does it matter where it comes from so you don't have to like they always get mad i'm like i do i'll do like bits press i'll do squats last they're like why I was like, oh, because he was like, it's the best movement. Why wouldn't you want to get the most out of it? I was like, I'm Did training. Did you see my quads? <laughs> <laughs> it's like, I'm training the movement pattern. Like, I'm trying to build muscle in my quads or my legs. So, however I get to that fatigue, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. If squats are the last thing I do, I don't care about the weight. It's the reps. It's the range of motion. And by that time, it's mine. So, I'm like, so I always say is you're fine with doing squats first and then shitting on your unilateral movements or skipping them or not mm. doing them, but you're okay with <laughs> the, getting the squats. I'm like, so which one is it? So you kind of figure it out. And I take that approach because now when I'm doing squats last, I know everything's going to be working. Yeah, Like nothing's going to be lacking. All muscles going to be firing. Everything's going to be, I may have to use less weight, mm -hmm. but I know I'm getting what I need out of the movement. Mm -hmm. And when you start off with it, you may not be as warmed up. It may take too long for you to be able to, you know, by you probably your last set probably be your best set you did because now everything's fine. But you only got one good set of mm -hmm. <laughs> squats instead of having every set be good. I think your your page is an amazing resource because like if someone were to look through it and just first off, think about the way that you're moving. Right, think about all the angles that you're doing some of these movements. Someone can go in and just be like, "When is the last time that I've actually even moved in this way?" Mm. Right? Because if looking at that, if anybody goes to your page right now, they don't have to go down very far to realize I haven't moved that way in a long time. It, may, it might have been years, mm -hmm. right? So you think about the way you like most people work out already. There, everything is sagittal. Everything is both. Everything is both sides, right? So it's like getting yourself to move in different ways really will just help keep the body young. Right, it, it unlocks everything. Really. Yeah, it really unlocks everything, and and that's why I think I became obsessed with it because I started doing it. And I was like, this helps with so much. Like, I don't have to squat to get better at squat. I can do a lateral lunge, and now I'm better at squat. Yeah. It's like it's weird. I never thought that could be a thing, but mm -hmm. once I started doing these, it's like I don't have. I'm rotating now. I'm doing all this stuff, and it's like it's helping movements without me doing them. It's like imagine getting better at a bench press without using the barbell. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, I would do this all the time because you know what happens. You barbell bitch press three times a week. You're going to deal with shoulder stuff so you can avoid that and still get better at it. Why not? <laughs> yeah, and the same thing's going to happen on deadlifts and squats and stuff like that. I mean, these are great exercises. Those are great implements. But I, I've said this many times, you know, what makes a barbell great is also what makes it detrimental sometimes. Yeah, yeah. Doing it too often, you may run into elbow and you may run into all kinds of different issues. With a kettlebell, I'm not saying that that's impossible, mm -hmm. like because I'm sure that you still have aches and pains and mm -hmm. different things. Um, but the amount of weight that you're going to use uh, with kettlebell training, as opposed to the amount of weight that you're going to use with a barbell, is just massively different. You know, someone might deadlift 600 pounds. You're not going to really move around a 600 pound kettlebell. For sure, there's no ego in it. The right. ego, the ego part of it is gone. And also, like that's it's fine. I, I enjoy lifting heavy sometimes. So like I'll find bigger bells or I'll get under a bar, but it doesn't need to be all the time. Mm -hmm. I, I put up a post before I was like, you don't have to live heavy 
to be strong. It, you don't have to lift heavy all the time to be strong. I'm strong and I probably lift at 60 to 7% of my mm -hmm. max majority of the time. I don't need to be at that one. I have some friends, they're always maxing out. He'll send me, mm -hmm. they get so pissed, they'll send me a video of them doing like a one rep and it's like constantly, I'll be like, what do you got? Like a meet coming up or something? Like what's the, what's the goal? What's the goal with this? Like what are you trying to accomplish? Because yeah. I know a lot of their goals is to build more muscle. I'm like, so why are you sending me you doing barely one rep? What do you think is coming from that? There's nothing coming from that. I mean, it's just your ego. So why not just take the weight down and wrap it out and build up what you're actually trying to do? You're trying to get more muscle. So why sh show me a post of struggling with her weight? Like, it's not, it's no point. I don't think people feel like they're getting stronger, though. Like, that's, I think, <laughs> I mean, don't get me wrong. I think lifting heavy, lifting heavy is cool. But I think some people that do it so much that it ends up being to their detriment, um, it, they don't feel like they make progress doing other things. Like they probably wouldn't feel like they're making progress doing some of the things you're talking about with the kettlebell, even though they probably would build muscle, they probably will build some strength and they'd probably move way better. But it doesn't feel like 500 pounds of a deadlift, you know? That's the ego thing. And once you get rid of that, you realize how many goals you can actually reach by just training the right way and just movement patterns. Man, you don't have to get caught up in load and all that stuff. It's just not necessary. And I love training heavy, but every time I do it, it's because it's an ego thing. <laughs> you want to <laughs> test yourself. Yeah, I want to test it. I want to see where I rank amongst people I've seen lift this or lift that. So the moment, the first, I'm different though. If I see somebody do a heavy squat, I'm like, I wonder if I can split squat that way. <laughs> <laughs> like, I'll be like, like right now, I'm still chasing my 500 pound split squat. Jesus it's just because Christ. I'm like, why not do it that way? Doing a, a pe Most people that chase a 500-pound squat, they either get hurt doing it or when they do it, it doesn't look like it's functional enough to be mm -hmm. able to complete a rep. Mm -hmm. If I do a 500-pound split squat, I know for a fact I built up the stability, the mo mobility, the range of motion to be able to perform that. So I'm getting the benefits of training that way and drilling that so it's going to be helpful no Have matter what. Have you ever seen this uh, monstrous cyclist uh Doing split I've squats and Bulgarians and stuff. I've, I've seen His it. quads are just absolutely. I've just, seen it. I mean, I I want to say he's like <laughs> using nearly six hundred pounds. Yeah, he yeah, he is. I, I I make fun though because I don't, I don't, his range is not always there. <laughs> <laughs> oh look, he gypped the range of motion. Would you look at that. Like, yeah, Do you know what his at? Do you know what his handle is? Um, it's like what is it? Like, uh, I mean, he's world class. Yeah, he's he's like a world class. Yeah, he cycler. might be like one of the best in the world. You know. Damn. Oh my God. Yeah. Oh, you found him? I think so. I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah, that's him. 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 Yeah, look at his legs. Yeah. <laughs> Those legs might be so big that we don't his, think it's his, his ass. ass. That's so that's why <laughs> yeah, I'm like, oh be. god. Hey, get that off the screen. I just like, feel right. But like that yeah. like stuff like that motivates me. I want to be like, I want to get everybody to do it that. It motivates me too. <laughs> what? <laughs> Hold up, Andrew. Hold up, Andrew. I'm talking, dude. Let's be big here. Let's be adults. I'm talking about his fat ass. <laughs> his, uh, like, I think he has, like, one of the highest, like, watt outputs on a bike or something yeah. ever. Some shit. I mean, it's just... And then look at the form and technique that he has Dude, when he's lifting. It's unbelievable. Like, what are those, like, uh, centaurs? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. 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 That's wild. Those quads are monstrous, bro. Yeah, that's crazy. Jesus. Oh, is that 10? Okay. That's an interesting sport. Mm-hmm. It is um, funny though. Like, don't forget what you're about yeah. to say, Mark. But like, I remember I <laughs> take it off the screen, Andrew. I'm man. I'm straight. <laughs> I'm a man. <laughs> I got hypnotized. <laughs> no, but like, nah, I remember, that's beautiful, man. <laughs> <laughs> I remember when I was younger, I used to, um, oh, I used to always get like elbow tendonitis, man. Because I'll just biceps, triceps, press, mm. biceps, triceps, press. I can't remember the last time I've had any type of issue there. You know mm. what I mean? And that's 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 awesome. Because mm. it's not like the size went away. Because you don't, and it's great not to have those type of things stop you from lifting. Mm -hmm. With us, it's like we'll figure out a way to get through it because we love working out. We look, but the average everyday individual, the first time they have pain or the first time they're done. Yeah. That's it. Because they've been told and they've been, they all they hear is, you don't train with pain. Mm. But my approach is different. It's like, all right, you explore pain. Like, why am I dealing with this? Like, what can I do around this to either make it better or to get stronger in different ways? So it's like a lot of times just like have people understand like pains happen. Like your 
people are like my lower back hurt when I deadlift. Well, it's actually kind of a lower back exercise. <laughs> like sometimes mm-hmm. it may be just soreness from deadlifting right. or training, or you could have done something wrong. Either way, it's normal to deal with some aches and pains in your lower back when you deadlift. Mm-hmm. It's it's just normal. It's super interesting when you start to like really think about some of these things we're talking about. You know, if you if you're to do a deadlift, right? Just a regular conventional deadlift and you're trying to, I don't know, maybe do sets of five. At some point you can build up, you know, a pretty good amount of strength. Maybe your form is off or maybe your technique is off for the day or maybe you weren't ready for that particular weight and you kind of tweak something. I'm imagining, and you can, you know, probably answer this really well. If you're using a kettlebell and you kind of get like a tweak, I'm imagining that the pain is maybe a little less because you're using less weight. Like mm-hmm. what has been your experience with that? It's, it's a little less because you're using less weight. It's, it's, it's different. And the range of motion is a little different from a barbell. You mm-hmm. kind of be able to. But when you're working the unilateral stuff, you can, you're can you always using less weight. And it's always the quality of the movement over the load. So if you always work in the quality of the movement, you don't really break form that much because you're always drilling it from mm-hmm. that angle of it. Once you start to load, start to be the main focus, that's when the quality of the movement starts to drop. And that's when the aches and mm-hmm. the pains come. But when you... Dealing with this, it's more about what you can and can't do. A lot of times when you're dealing with people, it's like, I don't have the stability to be able to do this exercise. So we got to find the variation they can do, but we're still using less weight. Mm. Yeah, not a single leg deadlift. <laughs> anyone's ever tried them. I mean, they light your hamstrings up like crazy. They do. But you just see time and time again, people choose not to do them. Yeah, because it's, it's hard. <laughs> it's hard. I mean, because it requires more. And that's my, my obsession to do things that require more than just strength. I want to do exercise and do weightlifting that requires me to be stable, have mobility, have power, have strength, and have muscle, not just do something that only requires strength. I'm going to stand in one spot and do as much strength as I can do. And talk about longevity. Yeah. What, what you said right there, yeah. like, you know, when you're 60, you're definitely going to want to have good balance, right? Exactly. And people don't. They neglect it. They think it's not a big thing. Like, I don't need, to, how many people that could do like a body weight RDL mm-hmm. on single leg? Mm-hmm. And number's not high. <laughs> it's like, most people can't. They just see it as, what's the benefit of that? You'll ask them, like, what's the benefit of that? Well, actually, uh, there's a lot of benefit in being able to stand on one leg. Like, the stability, the core strength, all that stuff is going to be important when you're 50 and 60 years old. Now you're just chasing muscle. Yeah, so it doesn't look like it's the most appealing thing. Yeah. But when you're done with the muscle chase and you're living life mm. as a human being and you have all that tension from that time under tension, and you have no stability. Now what? <laughs> when you think about <laughs> that's a bar. I think about uh, what you said earlier about you know maybe saving particular exercises for the end. Mm-hmm. So now imagine um, you know you love to get like let's just say this person loves to get hyped up. They love to do the heavier lifts. Now let's just say like it's deadlift day. Well, if you're utilizing your approach. I don't really need the pre-workout. Mm-hmm. I don't need a lot of hype. I don't need to get all crazy. The right song doesn't have to come on at the right time <laughs> if for, in order for me to make the lift. I don't need the smelling salts, right? And we know what happens when you do those things. Those things can be fun and it can be exciting. I've done all that stuff and it's, it would work sometimes, mm-hmm. um, but it also drains the shit out of you. Mm-hmm. You know, it really uh, impacts your central nervous system a ton. But Imagine, you know, instead of it's deadlift day in that fashion, you're thinking a little bit more along the lines of what you're saying. And you go in and you do like a single leg RDL. You do things that are hamstring focused. You do sing, a couple single leg movements. And now, you know, we're we're pretty taxed. Uh, mm-hmm. We had a really good training session. And now we're going to finish with uh, three sets of six of regular barbell deadlift. Now, now we can kind of, you know, quote unquote, have our fun. Mm-hmm. But the weight that you're going to use at that point is going to be reduced because, mm-hmm. you know, so you're putting a a kind of a governor, you're putting a little bit of a limitation on what you can lift for the day. And I know some people might be bummed by that. Mm-hmm. Um, but over time, as you get used to it, you'll get in better condition, you'll get in better shape, and you'll probably be able to lift more weight at the way end of more. the workout. <laughs> way more, than, way more. And that's the idea of taking, always focusing on the quality of the movement instead of just pushing through it. Because now you, you're building up all those areas that is making your deadlift stronger. So I don't see it as a deadlift thing. This is a pull day. We're working our mm-hmm. glutes, we're working our hamstrings. And whatever is going to get us better at that movement. So if that movement's less and we're using less weight, now the quality of that movement is going to be great because all the muscles are going to be at the party to do their part. Mm-hmm. So when we continue to train at that point, the weight's going to continue to rise, even if we continue to still do it last. But you don't always have to do it last. Say you want to do it first one day. 
after you've been doing it last for multiple weeks. Mm -hmm. It's going to be, it's going to feel a lot better now. Right. Because you've been building up those muscles to help instead of just deadlifting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, I, I find it really cool when we podcast, when like certain guests say something specific one after the other. Single leg RDL, <laughs> who's the last person to mention that? Jordan Shallow, who yeah. was just here recently, right? Yeah. He also mentioned like the import, like he'll, that's one of his assessments for his NFL athletes and all his athletes. Like, can you do a single leg RDL? Can you zone into that glute and hamstring on one leg when you're doing these movements? If not, there's a hole in the system, mm -hmm. right? So it's like, it's it's awesome that you do this like for yourself. You see all the single leg movements you do on your page, but you're also doing this with your clients. Mm -hmm. And that's such a cool thing for them because when they're 60, 70, 80 and they're able to balance on one leg looking around when their fucking cousin at 60 <laughs> fucking broke their hip, unfortunately, they'll be thanking Dre. Yeah. I mean, that's why I say, I always tell people, they say, is it a, in heavy squat impressive or heavy like split squat or heavy RDL, single leg RDL? I was mm -hmm. like, I think those are more impressive because it requires more than just strength. Yeah. You can push through a squat just by just pure grit you got strength, you're pretty strong, and you've been under the weight before. It may not look the best, but you can push through it and you can get through it. You can't fake through a split squat, a heavy split squat. If you don't got it, you don't got it. It's mm -hmm. not happening. <laughs> it's not happening. How do you uh, help people manage their body weight? Um, it, it's try to have it not be the focus. Because that's the beauty of the other thing about working in these different planes of mo motions and different ways of training. You work a lot harder. You're not just when you, that's the downside of like building strength and building muscle. You have to be more dialed into your food because it's like you're burning less mm. because you're trying to build, but which is fine if you can handle eating a certain amount, make sure you get the steps as well. But when you're training in a way where you're, you're training endurance, you're training mobility, you're training stability, you're burning a lot more calories. You have a lot more wiggle room because your, your output is so much higher. Mm. So it allows you to be able to burn more calories and lose weight, feel better, be in more pain and train longer so you can get the results you want. And you can kind of tweak where you want to, if I want to go to a more of a building range, building muscle phase, like you could add more exercises here and add more exercises there to kind of get the feel you want. But when you talk about like performance, it's always about how you perform. And if you're eating good and you're eating properly, you're always going to look like how you perform. Like my biggest thing with people I always say is like, there's no point in looking like Superman if you can't be Superman. Like you can't do the things he do, move the way he moves because you only train a certain way. Like you don't have the ability to run. You don't have the ability to jump. You don't have the ability to go left or go right. You only can move forward or backward or up. It's like you want to be able to do everything. So we train in a way where we do everything. And when you have performance like that, your body usually looks like you can perform. <laughs> Mm -hmm. I dig that. I think that uh, it's a good distraction too, but I, I guess you do have to kind of buckle down and then, you know, teach people about nutrition here mm -hmm. and there. What do, what do you usually kind of lay out for them when you do get to that point? So it's, 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 it starts from like the movement piece. It's like, make it more about, like I always say, let's do exercise first. Cause I want to get you used to being able to move a certain amount and having your body respond to what it we're doing so now you can reassess, like, am I eating to be able to train this hard or train this way? And if I'm not eating this way, I need to be, how can I change it to be able to do it? Because once they fall in love with moving this way and move, performing this way, like, I want to do this all the time. So you can start doing things that allow you to do this more. So a lot of times it means food. It means sleep. It means recovery, hydration. So now you start to implement these things little by little. You'll change a certain food. You have more protein. You have a little more carbs here. You're like, I can get more out of my lifting with this. I can get more out of my sessions with this. It's going to get me more results. It's going to get me, I'm going to lose more fat. And it's a game of just seeing out how good can I get? How, how better can I get at this or that? Instead of just saying like, let's do food now, they don't really understand like why. Like, why are we doing food now? Like, what is the benefit of it? Like, what going strict with a diet, how is it going to help? So I never, I, food is always like secondary for me. It's like, let's get you performing and let's get you enjoying what you're doing and constantly doing it at a high level. So now you can feel the fatigue of what it does to you. And that fatigue is normally signaling, I need to do something to help my body be able to get through this. Because the workouts are hard. And once you get through them, you're, you're, you beat. And you're like, either I'm going to just be sitting out for a couple of days or I'm going to start eating things that allow me to do this or I'm going to quit. 
Mm-hmm. <laughs> and most of the time, people enjoy it because it's so different and they want to continue to do it. So they start doing things that allow them to do more of it. And that's where the food comes in. And it just it happens so gradually. And it just becomes like a life thing. They start to avoid the drinking because they're like, if I drink, I can't train four days in a row. If I can't train four days in a row, my movement's not going to look good. They start to weigh out these things and the trade-offs of approaching it this way. And slowly they start to remove things that don't apply and help them be better at what they enjoy doing and performing the way they like to perform. Mm. I really like what you said there because what you're getting people to do is to look at themselves like an athlete. I think that not everybody, some people will look at the things that athletes do in gyms or jujitsu or whatever and be like, ah, they're an athlete. And when they exercise, it's literally just exercise. Mm -hmm. It's just like something I got to get my exercise in. Mm -hmm. So I'm healthier. So they don't look at the gym as being something that they need to go in and perform, Mm -hmm. but you're getting people to look at themselves. Like you are an athlete too. If you have a body, you can be an athlete. You don't have to look a certain way. You can be an athlete. And when you treat yourself like a good athlete does, well, their food is fuel for their performance. Mm -hmm. And if they're not performing well, they're going to go think about, okay, what am I doing as far as my food, my sleep, my habits to be able to perform the best way possible. You're making everyone into an athlete. And that's, that's a beautiful thing because more people should look at themselves that way. Yeah, Athletes sure. aren't special. You can be a fucking athlete. And mm-hmm. that's the biggest thing people don't understand. Is people say like, what am I doing this for? I don't play anything. <laughs> like you play the game of life. <laughs> and life, I mean, you got to be good at, I was talking about this the other day on the post. I was like, the amount of times I go places and I travel and I just see, I'm looking around. I'm like, if something tragic was to happen here, it's like maybe two people that would be able to run and get out of the way of harms because they're not in a position where they're overweight or they can run, they can sprint, they can lift. Like that stuff happens all the time. And mm-hmm. if you're not equipped to be able to be capable to like handle the situation, bad things can happen. Yeah. So it's like, are you equipped and are you prepared for life? And most people aren't. <laughs> a constant thing that's been beneficial for all of our health has been intaking enough protein, but also intaking quality protein. And that's why we've been partnering with Good Life Proteins for years now. Good Life not only sells Piedmontese beef, which is our favorite beef, and the main reason why it's our favorite is because they have cuts of meat that have higher fat content, like their ribeyes and their chuck eyes, but they also have cuts of meat like their flat iron. Andrew, what's the macros on the flat iron? Yeah, dude. So the flat iron has 23 grams of protein, only two grams of fat, but check this out. Their grass-fed sirloin essentially has no fat and 27 grams of protein. There we go. So whether you're dieting and you want lower fat cuts or higher fat cuts, that's there. But you can also get yourself chicken. You can get yourself fish. You can get yourself scallops. You can get yourself all types of different meats. And I really suggest going to Good Life and venturing in and maybe playing around with your proteins. I mean, going back to the red meat, there's pecania. All kinds of stuff. chorizo sausage. There's maple bacon. That like, stuff's incredible. The maple bacon is yeah, so good. Yeah, maple bacon's those, really good. Yo, my girl put those in these uh, bell peppers with uh, a steak Ooh, and chicken. Yes. And oh my God, it was so good. But either way, guys, protein is essential. And the Good Life is the place where you can get all of your high quality proteins. So Andrew, how can they get it? Yes, you can head over to goodlifeproteins.com and enter promo code POWERPROJECT to save 20% off your entire order. Links in the description as well as the podcast show notes. So like when you're talking about like what's impressive, I think it's impressive that you do all the things and then go out on a five, six mile run. (laughs) Just, you know, again, you're expressing strength in so many different ways. Um, But when you do have something that's quote lacking or you, you find a weakness, what's your approach or how do you, you know, suggest people approach some of these weaknesses when it comes to training? Because like, you know, me, if I'm like, oh, my left bicep's lacking compared to my right side. So I'm going to do like, you know, 10 extra reps on that side or whatever. You know, like I'll just, I'll, I'll bro it out. Right. Like mm-hmm. I'll think of something that doesn't make sense in the real world, that made but, sense, though. <laughs> but in the gym, it could make sense where I'm like, no, I got to work twice as hard to, you know, and like mm-hmm. do the math in my head that always comes out way wrong. But like for yourself, because it seems to be working very well, like what's your approach when something's lacking? Um, it depends on what it is. So like, if it's like the biggest thing for me with like lifting in different areas that I work in, like running was the biggest issue for me. It was like, that was what was lacking. It was like, so you pretty much got to do a lot of it. And when you do it, pay attention to why it's lacking and where it's lacking. You kind of address that within your training. And if it's a phase where I'm dealing, like I do a lot of toe and I do a lot of foot stuff, but for a while I had bad ankles. I played football in my life, got my ankles taped. Anytime, you know, after taping ankles for a year, your, your, your ankles are just weaker. Mm. 
So I do a lot of stuff where my ankles are being exposed. So I'm putting my ankles on a presser constantly. I'm doing a lot of stuff where I'm on my toes and training in that way. And that's helping me that way. And it's helping me be able to run better. It's just kind of just finding out why and exploring why. You don't really, you can't do that by stopping. A lot of people stop and they're like, let me figure out why. I got to stop doing this, figure out why. And you don't really figure it out. You got to keep doing it and feel where you need to feel and pay attention to why it does this stretch in different ways and kind of address it that way. But when it's something like a bicep or a tricep, that's usually just a strength thing or muscles not being balanced or you're stronger, your chest is stronger in different areas. Mm-hmm. It's usually something simple as that. Mm-hmm. I want to second what you actually just said right there about your ankle. I, I had the same thing. My left ankle, for some reason, I was just like, I'd be jump roping a lot. I'd be doing certain things that there'd just be this pain in my left ankle that would pop up where I'd be like, fuck, okay, I can't jump as much today. But when I started to like kind of hit the stability piece of it, like, again, that slant board thing I just told you about, mm-hmm. balancing, spreading my toes. And, and one thing that I started to feel was like when I would spread my big pinky toe, the activation on the outside of the ankle that I would get when I would go up on there, I'd be like, oh, that that hits the spot that hurts. Mm-hmm. That means there's a weakness there because my foot never gets into position. Let me work this position more. Voila. I haven't had that ankle issue in a, really, in a pretty damn long time, right? Mm-hmm. So that's just, it's really cool how these, these things are, or kind of from left field because I don't hear many people no. talking about that shit. I had to do something from fucking uh, Brian McGinty, play around with it to have that solution. But I don't hear many people mention that. Yeah. So. I mean, it's just exploring, man. Like yeah. it's like when I deal with certain pains, I, I want to find out why. Like, why is this a thing? And like, because I'm not going to let me let it stop me from exercising. And I'm, go- I'm going to have that attitude that I'm going to push through it. But I'm going to push through it with a plan of figuring out why is it doing this? And once I figure it out, I'm just going to address it and deal with it from a strength standpoint. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I kind of feel like uh, some of the areas that are going to cramp, you know, when you go to try to do something and it it cramps up and it's not from just hydration, Mm -hmm. I think it's actually a good sign you probably need to work on that. Yeah, I've noticed that doing uh, stuff with my feet. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I'll get like a little cramp in there and I'm like, man, what is that? (laughs) But I need to like just relax and then try it again. And it's not... It's weird to say, but it's like not, it doesn't, it's not the same as like a regular like uh, dehydration cramp. For sure. And a lot of times it's, it's hard to, certain muscles we have, it's hard to isolate them. So while you're still training in a way where you're trying to build that area, it's never really isolated to really build the same strength it needs to be able to build like, like a quad can or a Mm. glute cran. Like, so certain, like my hamstrings, I feel like sometimes that's why machine work has been decent because now I can use the hamstring curl to really isolate and build that area. And I wouldn't be able to do that, just training kettlebells. So it's like, and that's why it's like, all right, same reason why I started using kettlebells, the same reason why I can't let allow it to limit me to other things. Like a hamstring curl is amazing. You're doing mm. it full range of motion. You can build your hamstring up. You can't really do that using kettlebells. You could got to find other ways to kind of get that area stronger as you're building up. And that's what a lot of the the cramps and stuff is. Like, it's a weakness. A lot mm-hmm. of times it's a weakness. Have you had situations where you had to, just because like a wrist or something, something got too beat up and you had to you get away from the kettlebell and do something else? No, I haven't. I, surprisingly, I don't I don't get that stuff as much anymore mm-hmm. because I, the approach I do, I just, I don't. And the, at the end of the day, it's never really about the instrument. I love the instrument because it allowed me to express and find the movements that I'm doing. Mm-hmm. But the movements can be done with anything. It's just about the movement. Yeah, it can be done with nothing. Yeah, with nothing <laughs> yeah, right. as well. And a lot of people, they should day. start with nothing. Mm-hmm. But for some people, they like the idea. I want It makes me feel like I'm working out because I'm holding mm-hmm. a bell or holding something. It makes me feel like I'm working out. So that's where it came into place with that. Where have you seen like kind of the biggest glaring weakness when you do work with people, when you do see people in person or you get people commenting on your app or... Uh, people commenting on your social media. What do you think is like a glaring weakness that you might see globally in fitness? Um, stability, obviously range of motion, mobility. A lot of that, a lot of the stuff that isn't um, highlighted from just doing regular movement. Like a lot of times people are just stuck in the same, like I want to bro it out. Mm-hmm. A lot of things that the bodybuilding split doesn't address that's where our biggest weakness is. Because a lot of people, we, we first get into fitness because how we look. And we really want to focus on getting better muscle, all that. Yeah. But we neglect how we feel and how we move. So anything that involves movement or rotation, that's like the biggest weakness in the industry. No and balance. No balance, yeah. no nothing. Because it's like, 
what this balance is going to get me if I'm trying to build muscle? This is not going to get me anything. <laughs> For these people, they're like, it's no point. Like, I got bro that work out all the time. It's just like the stuff that you do, it, it doesn't benefit me. I was like, all right, all right. We can have this talk now, but at some point, when you're done with this bodybuilding stuff and you look at your body and you're broken and you can't because you don't have the knowledge to work around it and figure it out, you're not going to work out anymore and you're going to gain weight and you're going to hate it and you're not going to be able to do anything about it because you decided to take this route where it was all about how you look and not about how you feel and how you move. How old are you, bro? 31. Okay, the reason why I asked you that is because like, <laughs> I, 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 for some, I, I vibe with everything you're saying right now too, but like, I just imagine myself at like 22, 21, like, Fuck you. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> just they don't want to hear it. They don't want to hear it. And that's why I, from some time to time, I'll do like the bro stuff that people was like, I can still do this. Don't think because I don't do it. I I'm still can't the game. do it. Like I, I can do it. It's just, I don't have to do it. And me, by me taking this approach, it's showing you that it doesn't have to be all you do to be able to do it at that level. Yeah. It's just good. It's good for people to examine stuff, right? Like a leg, leg extension. I don't know. Maybe... Maybe it gives, gives you a good burn. Maybe people like that exercise, um, but it's not going to really assist with stability. Yeah. Um, for somebody that's untrained, maybe it will assist a little bit with strength, but I don't think that when we think about strength or when we think about stability that we think of a leg, leg extension We don't, machine. we don't. But it, it's, the, the flip side of it is that people could say, um, and that's why I've been getting more into adding in that stuff because it's not like, that stuff is still beneficial. Yeah. It's still very beneficial in... You, if you neglect it and you become too far this way, you miss out on some of the gains of that stuff as well. So it's, it's great to acknowledge that it still works, but it's not the end goal. It's like there's more. It's like the idea is to be able to do what the machine do without being in the machine. Mm. It's like a lot of the times the machines, they're fixed positions. They, they remove the stability, the balance piece out of it. But that doesn't mean you're not supposed to have that stability and that right. balance. Like you still want to have it. And it makes using the machine better when you do have it. Because it's like, yeah, I'm using this, but I can stand on one leg. I can do a single leg RDL. I can do all this stuff as well. So it's like, it's more beneficial to be able to have both. I love what you're saying. Because like when I was a personal trainer, I did it many, many years ago. But I did work with a lot of people. And I recall, you know, having them do certain exercises and balance, you know, would be a tricky thing for mm -hmm. them. I would say, let's just take the balance out of it. Just hold this stick or hold, you know, hold this machine. Mm -hmm. And then they can, but a, mach a, uh, a machine that you're actually utilizing, you know, a leg press, leg, a leg extension, it takes all the stability out of it. Mm -hmm. So if you're doing something standing on one leg and you're using a dowel or something to kind of help you balance, you took some stability out yeah, of it. Somewhat. You took a little of the challenge out of it because maybe it's new, it's <coughs> novel to you and you're getting used to it. Um, but you didn't take all of it out. Not all of it. And I say the same thing with, like, I never, when I squat and I do stuff, like, I don't use, like, scraps or, like, um, like dead, I don't use, like, belts or anything like mm. that. Because it's, like, this stuff helps and it aids, but the goal is to be able to do it without, right? I mean, that's, uh, that's the ultimate goal, to have the ability to perform and be able to create tension where you don't need a belt to create that tension for you to be able to perform this, this deadlift. So it's, like, <clears throat> it requires you stepping back and it requires like really longevity approach. Like I'm going to build strength for the long run and build muscle for the long run. And I'm not going to force pass and use things to aid me to build strength before I'm able to really like withstand it. Mm. So like the knee stuff and all the, the wraps and all that, like I said, this to people all the time when it comes to like, why don't you just use scraps when you're using like a something of dead? I was like, all right, but I would like to have that grip strength and the strength and forearm strength to be able to do it without. Mm-hmm. So if it's possible, I'm going to pursue that. Well, the nice thing about, so, I mean, just think about this. Anyone who's done any uh, decent amount of deadlifting, if all you ever use is a double overhand grip and you <sighs> didn't hook grip it, it's it's nearly impossible that you ever hurt yourself deadlifting. Mm -hmm. For Because sure. you can't hold on to that shit. <laughs> yeah. So again, you, you put a kind of governor, you put a little limitation on the exercise. Some, I mean, you could still get hurt doing anything, but yeah. you get my point. Well, you take yourself to the point where you can go. You don't push past that point by using other things and you build it the right way, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. But some people are like, all right, why wouldn't I use this? It's going to help me lift more. But I'm like, but what if you can't actually lift more? And now you're loading your body in a way where it's not prepared for. Part of your sport, it's part of what you're doing, then maybe, right? Yeah. You know, oh, yeah. Like you have a purpose for it because it's just that about one About to compete rep. and your elbow's killing you. It's like, makes sense. But yeah, yeah to do it long term doesn't make any sense. And that's where I get at. It. It's like long term wise. 
it doesn't, it's, there's no benefit. Let me ask you this, man. Do you think uh, that you should never get injured in the gym? Um, no. I think you should know how to deal with injuries. I think a lot of times I don't like getting injured because a lot of people don't know why they're getting injured and they don't know how to deal with it. But mm -hmm. yeah, you get injured if you're pushing. That's like saying you should never fatigue. You're pushing hard enough on something. Yeah. It's going to come. Mm -hmm. But just knowing how to address it when it happens. Like serious injuries, I don't I don't necessarily think they should happen because there's always signs this before to tell you like, this is probably going to end up bad if you keep pushing this or this is not going to be good or this actually is very painful. You should stop. Yeah. And people push past that point. So it's like, all right, that was just, you should have known better. Mm -hmm. Like you just got to pay attention to it. Like I've felt like there's sometimes I've been doing dips or something and I felt like the <laughs> pull, I feel like the pull in my chest and I'm like, oh, I keep pushing this. I know what's going to happen. So I stop. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, so it's just paying attention and having body awareness to understand like, is it really necessary to do this? But I think a, a cool thing there too is that like you took it to a point where like you felt that. Yeah. And the, uh, uh, something that I kind of struggle with is like, I never want anybody to get injured working out in the gym. You know, it's like, if you get injured, it ideally it shouldn't be in the gym. It should mm -hmm. be if you're, it, it should be in your sport. You don't want to get injured in your sport, but it should be on the field, you know? But the other side of it is like, the reason why I've been able to make so much progress with a lot of things is because I pushed certain things to a point to kind of test where my personal limit was. Yeah. And then I figured that limit out either because I brushed really close or because I actually fucking tweaked something, right? Where I'm like, all right, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know I know where that is. But then I'm able to use that as like, okay, yeah, this is a one weaker, two weaker. All right, mm -hmm. cool. Now I know where I can start pushing. Now I know how to brush up against that limit and see what I can push, right? So it's, it's a tough thing because there's some trainers, and I get it, you know, you never want a client to get injured. You don't want people to get mm -hmm. in, You don't want people doing irresponsible things in the gym. But at the same time, it's like, sometimes if they don't, people don't end up making much progress. Like, they don't end yeah. up making just serious that. progress. You know what I mean? Like, they'll make progress, and it's cute, Yeah, but, but yeah. it's not like serious progress. Right. You know what I'm talking they about? You gotta push. I said this to him earlier. I was like, Building muscle, building real muscle, sustaining long-term muscle, and just muscle in general, you have to be almost about to get injured. <laughs> Seriously. Like, no kidding. You have to be pushing to the point where- I mean, you're tearing it down. Yeah. You have to be pushing to the point, and you notice the people, like like the functional crew, yeah. they don't have much muscle because they believe they shouldn't push to that point, and they never push to that point. So they don't really ever build any muscle because they're afraid of getting hurt, but- you have to be able, think of all the people you know that have a ton of muscle. They've dealt with some injuries. Just It's just the part of it. Like You have to be able to push to that point to know like it's at the end. That's what fatigue is. It's like, also a skill. Mm -hmm. It is. But yeah. now you have a better sense of it. I mean, you were mentioning earlier in the podcast, you basically will go until you know something starts to almost burn. Yeah. And I think it's just uh, amazing intuition. I mean, that is the pump. That is hypertrophy. That is what kind of what we're searching yeah. for is the... But you can brush up against that many different ways. You know, you were mentioning having a friend that that sends you his one rep max all the time. <laughs> you know that that is an easier way to get hurt uh, in a way that might be really hard to recover from, all yeah. the way to the point where you may never recover from yeah. it. Whereas if you are wise and you're making different decisions, again, freak things can happen to people all, all the time. time. You get hurt doing whatever, but in general. Um, people used to ask me all the time, you know, how, how do you select these jumps, you know, when you're getting closer to your max? And I said, always, always, always. And I preached it in so many different videos. Always choose the lesser weight. Should mm -hmm. I add a 10 or a 25? Add a 10. Yeah. yeah. Because you miss that 10 and it's, it's kind of weird. It's like, okay, we can talk about it and we can say, <laughs> hey, let's give it another go. But uh, hey, I thank God we didn't try the extra 50 pounds we were going <laughs> to <Yeah. laughs> just throw on the bar. And so- you know, be conscious of it and be cautious. You still need to be, there needs to be a certain amount of aggression. Mm -hmm. There needs to be a certain amount of, um, of, of you, not even aggression, a certain amount of intensity mm -hmm. uh, with the, um, not just in weight selection, not just in intensity of how much weight you're utilizing, um, but in uh, the intensity of the actual movement. How hard is the actual mm -hmm. movement? Mm -hmm. If we don't ever brush up against eight, nines and stuff like that, um, we're not going to really know exactly where we need to be. For sure. And that's why I feel like, so you ever see me do some of the heavier, like toe elevated stuff. I'm, I'm doing like 
on 385 pounds on my toes. It's like, how do I know that? It's like, because I knew what the 315 felt like. 385 like, on your toes? What do you, what is, <laughs> right, we gotta see this. It's up there somewhere. You might have to dig. It's kind of, I feel kind of embarrassed. This guy's lifting 385 <laughs> pounds with his toes. <laughs> Uh, it's it's deep. Like you have, oh, yeah, even I'll just gotta keep going then. Yeah, yeah. But uh, but but the same with the um the split squat or mm -hmm. the well, I'm doing the three ninety five split squat. Like I oh. I felt I was it right there. Is that? I mean, it's a big that may be three eighty five. Oh, nice. But still, oh wow, yeah, boy, it's one <laughs> it's one before that. Scroll you scroll off a little bit. You're fine. Let me see. Let me yeah, see. Of fake videos. All these, all these videos are just with the left leg. Let's I, see. Let's I demand see. you to try it with your right leg. Let's see. Let's see. Tomorrow. We'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> well, then we have to have somebody that's going to weigh the plates. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 Exactly. But not that one. Nah. It's, it's, it's another different. Gym. So like this one here with the 315, like on my toes. So go to the left. This one? This one there. It's like, yeah. so you, 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 there we go. you test out what it feels like to do it. Oh, nice. A little bit before. Got lighter weight, mm -hmm. then you know what your body can do. <laughs> That's dude. Oh my God. The, but the, this is okay. This is why I love the ship. Because okay, first off, you know you mentioned the functional people, right? They they don't end up having much muscle. Well, they also say the things and like the muscle isn't functional. That the muscle is <laughs> going to slow you down. Yeah. So there's already this caveat to like, well, we don't want the muscle because the muscle doesn't help you move well. Okay, yeah. well let's just fucking move that <laughs> out of the way because we see fucking NFL athletes and all yeah, these other yeah. athletes with muscle. Okay, so fuck that. <laughs> but the second thing is like, again, you there. There's multiple skills that happen because first off, when you get to the point of being able to do something of like this, you have the skill of being able to push yourself to that point where you're like, this is not a roll of the dice, but it's. Yes, it's yeah. it's scary, but I know I can do it, right? Exactly. But then there's the other thing where it's like, you know, and I know, and you know, Mark, that if something happens with this, well, I know how to recover. Yeah. Like you, you, you have the tactics to like, like the other day, I was, I was testing some stuff out with my neck to see how hard I could push it, and I was purposefully like, you know, I had told people in the video I made, never go to failure, but I was like, all right, let me go to failure with this and kind of just see what happens. And I saw the fuck what happens. I fucked around and I found out. Like I, I tweaked a little something. I was like, all right, cool. I'll, I, I pushed it harder than I thought I would yeah. be able to, but I still tweaked something and it's, it's healing. It's going to fully heal. But the thing was, is like, I tested that mm -hmm. and I have the skills to rehab it. We have all the myofascial release. Mm -hmm. We know all these things to do mm -hmm. to, to speed up recovery. So we're not fucked. But when somebody doesn't have those skills, I can see how it's scary. And I can see how people are like, you shouldn't get injured in the gym. You should never, because if, if people don't know how to rehab themselves, right? If they don't, if they haven't ever tested themselves, then it, it could be really risky. Yeah. But they, you always, you always are speaking from your own experience. Yeah. Like I always say, there's no bad exercise. You may just be bad for that exercise because you don't have that ability. So, right now. Like, right now. And, yeah. and if you want it, you may be able to train and find out how you can get it. But people started lading, labeling exercise bad because someone tried it that couldn't do it. Mm-hmm. So all of a sudden it's bad. But no, no movement is bad. Do you have the ability? If you don't, do you want the ability? If you don't, so don't do the movement. Period. That's it. But if you watch somebody do something and they do it and they perform it perfectly, mm -hmm. they have the ability. So the movement's not bad. Like Atlas Power Shrugged <laughs> with his crazy heavy Jefferson curls <laughs> yeah. and his Zercher deadlifts, like yeah. in, the, in the threes, right in fours. But there's a group of people who say the Jefferson curl because you have to actually, when you're getting down that deep <clears throat> part of the lower back, you kind of have to turn off a bit. You can't hold too much tension mm -hmm. there. That's not functional. You shouldn't actually be doing that movement. <laughs> the thing that I wonder is like, again, well, you see someone who's been able to push it so well and their body's doing great and they're progressing. Why is this movement not functional? Yeah. Like, look, you, you're going to tell me that <clears throat> with the strength and physical ability he has that that's not functional. You're going to tell me that? Really? Well, it's also easy to look at these things and be like, oh, he's going to hurt himself. Well, yeah. of course he's probably going to hurt himself. He's doing some really intense uh, weights. He's doing some really heavy stuff. And I'm sure he's hurt himself. We'll have him on the show pretty soon. I think yeah. we can ask him. Um, so it's it's obvious that sometimes some of these people are going to get hurt doing some of these things. They are really pushing the limits. I think he has like a world record in that mm -hmm. lift, doesn't he? Does he? I didn't I know. Think, That's yeah, cool I think if he some does. shit like that. Yeah. But how do you know crazy. that if you never push it? Right. <laughs> like you never push it. You never. You'll never find that out. And I think that's where my struggle is with a lot of trainers is that they don't ever push it because they are so fearful of getting hurt or doing this. Mm. They never get any results. They never get anything because they don't train hard. 
Yeah. I was like, you think you train hard? Let's go through a session. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, so, because there's no way you train hard and you're never able to put on muscle or your your strength isn't what it's be for somebody that's been training 12, 15 years. How? Mm. How? What have you been doing? You know the recipe. You know how to build muscle. You know how to do all these things. How you have not been able to progress. Because that last piece, that grit, that push, you don't have it. You may not want it, which is fine. But don't say it shouldn't be done. Mm. And that's what they do. They was like, you shouldn't go to that point. They see me do stuff. It's like, how necessary is that? As necessary as I need it to be. <laughs> yeah. You, you, well, I think, again, you know, back to Atlas Shrugged and some of the stuff he's doing, some of the stuff you're doing, you want to do it. Yeah. You like you you enjoy it. It's what you love to do. Um, is it a little risky? Sure, but uh, calculated risk. Yeah, okay. Like I I I built up the. You did X amount before. Exactly. It's in the cards. This should be fine. Yeah, you should be able to do this not only for one rep, but I should be able to do it for a couple. Yeah, like with the one thirties today, one hundred thirty pound dumbbells. Yeah. You did some uh, incline bench press. Um, <sighs> Damn. You probably handled similar weights before. You mm -hmm. know your strength. You know how much you can handle. Uh, you know, one arm overhead, and yeah. you know the strength of your shoulders, and your triceps are enormous; they're popping out of your shirt. So, <laughs> you have a good understanding that 130 pounds um, isn't, uh, you know, it's not 60 pounds yeah. heavier than you've ever lifted before. Exactly, it's not out of range. When I went for the 140s. I was a little bit. I was like, I don't, I don't know about this. I, can I see, hate that. I, can I see, hate I, that. <laughs> you just fucking gave me PTSD. <laughs> <laughs> fucking I, a. I went for the 140. I was like, oh, oh this. I hate that. A little iffy. <laughs> Like this, may, <laughs> like, like, this may not go as good as I think, but we're going to see what we can do. I was able to get two and a half oh, reps. I hate that roll of the dice. I was Whoa. able to get two and a half reps, but the... There was more, like, it was like, if you were weighing it on the scale, I was more, like, I was com more confident than I was, than I yeah. was, like, it was going to But I was like, there is a chance that I may not be able to do this. There's a chance you can't even get them up into position or something. Yeah. And you, yeah chance that you got to throw them down earlier. It's embarrassing. And when you I, only did, like, <laughs> half a rep or something, you know? When I got them up in the first one, like, how to get them, I was like, oh, all right, <laughs> all right. And I pushed one. I was like, all right, that was good. That was tough. Yeah. And the second one, I was like, all right. The third one wouldn't go up. But I mean, I was testing my limit. Now mm -hmm. I know that 140 is like m towards my peak. So I didn't go for 150. Mm. I probably was, was like, oh, I did two reps. I could have did, I can do one or 150. That would have been the old me. But I didn't <laughs> because I knew that 140, I was like, this is probably it for a little while. You would have been like a sling <laughs> or something. I'm like, man. <laughs> like, that's it for a little while. So I stopped there. But that was me testing my limit. But this is also someone that I probably dumbbell bench probably once every like, four or five months, mm -hmm. I don't do the movement. I push ups, I dips, I'm overhead pressing. I'm never really practicing that movement. But how am I still getting better at it? Mm -hmm. What's your uh, heart rate at? Hey, do you ever, <coughs> you ever check that? You ever have a heart rate monitor on while you're doing when kettlebell training, work or uh, while you're running or anything? Yeah, when I'm training kettlebell stuff, I'll wear like a watch or something for a little while because sometimes I can't. It just hits the watch. It's yeah. annoying to deal with. But um, when I, I, so I train, so I'm hitting high level heart rate in the beginning of my workout. So like the hardest part of my workout is going to be at the beginning. And ever, ever from there, I'm just, I'm coming down. Like I'll get into the phase yeah, like where 170, I'm like 170, 180. But when mm -hmm. I'm like in the mid session, I'm at that like 120, 130 range. And towards the end, I'm kind of like lower and lower. And what about when you run? When I run, I run at the pace I run, I'm able to keep that 141. Mm -hmm. 149. So imagine I, your heart rate. Uh, what's your resting heart rate? Any idea? If it floats between like 42 and yeah, 49. I'm thinking it's probably low. With the, yeah. I mean, you're, the kettlebell workouts are... <laughs> the conditioning piece of it. It's, yeah, they're it's, tough. Which is weird. So like I've been paying attention to that. When I, my resting heart rate is at its lowest, it's when my body feels like the worst. It's, just, it's the weirdest mm. thing ever. Like I, What do you mean? It's like I'm like sore. I'm like I don't feel recovered. But my resting heart rate is... It's 42. I'm like, it's, you would think, like, I'm mm. rested. I'm recovered. Interesting. Like, I'm not signaling stress. Mm. But my body is just like, I'm always sore. So it's like, maybe that's just normal. I just tried to reach into my, like, Joel Jameson, like, computer. <laughs> Try to figure out why. guy who uh, does a lot of, he helped make HRV popular. Mm -hmm. yeah. He actually just told me about some of this recently, but I do not remember. Uh, yeah, I just yeah. came up with empty. Like, there's nothing... Yeah. 
I was like, oh, I can re- I can grab this, and there's nothing there. And I was trying to figure out why. It was like, this is my body. When you read something like that, when my resting is at like 42 or whatever, it's like it's signaling that I'm well rested at some point. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. But I feel awful. Like I'm sore. Like I'm really sore. I'm tired. I actually do know what he said. He said something to the effect of like your heart, your resting heart rate is going to go up and down. And then uh, over time, your VO2 max will will increase. But at first, he said sometimes your VO2 max will go down. Mm-hmm. So as you're kind of mentioning, like uh, this is an adaptation, right? Your heart rate is lower. And then maybe you're feeling like shit. You start to feel better. Maybe the heart rate goes back up yeah, and so back. on. And, and over time, not like your heart rate is going to keep toggling downwards. <laughs> it doesn't only go down so low. But yeah. Uh, being in the 40 range is amazing. Yeah. Especially yeah, but, with your size. But still, it's the the distance, the slow running that I've been doing. Yeah. I feel like it's always that or like the long training sessions I do, it always, my resting heart rate always goes to that point. And I think the highest has ever been probably around like 51 or something like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. All right. Where can people find you? Where can people uh, get a hold of your app and all that good stuff? Um, Every goddamn Dre on all platforms, YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, website, Kettlebell Functional Training. Yeah. We got to hit some We got hit some running together. Yeah, we're going to do some morning, yeah. If you guys enjoy this episode with every goddamn Dre, then click this episode right here with Colin Daring, where we talk about kettlebell uh, flipping. Yeah, I just did that here. So check this episode out. You'll learn so much about it. It's an awesome one. So click it. Click it. That could have been bad. That could have been bad.